all the prosperity folks will say, well, you got to look at Job. He had much. God was going to teach him a lesson, but in the end, he got it all back. And that's their, and that's their story. That's their message. Basically, your life, well, they don't tell you this. They don't tell you your life's going to turn into basically hell on wheels and that it's probably going to suck for a real long time. And there'll be periodic bouts where you think the sucking is over, okay? <laughs> and you feel like, whoa, it's great! <laughs> You're like on a roller coaster, but no, we're going down again. Brace yourself, right? That's Christianity. It's not a steady state. Colossians 2.8, where Paul says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. And my highlight last week was after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So let's do a little discussion here on this word tradition, first and foremost, because I think that's important. The Greek word paradosai, which is a compound para and dosis, and you'll find the word, the compound, occurring 13 times in the New Testament and not once in the Old Testament. Of the eight references to the word tradition are from the Lord himself, and of these eight uses, they are all derogatory. They are not meant in a good way. So when we talk about tradition, we have to, I have to define something right now so that I don't have people getting confused. I am not against, for example, someone who has cultural traditions. Traditions in a cultural way can be very good. They help us to remember certain things. But in terms of this book and in terms of the church, there may be things that we can isolate and understand as traditions. They may be things you may still want to keep doing but understand the difference between what God ordained for you as a believer and what somebody added in because either through time they thought people weren't smart enough to get it on their own or other forms of manipulation that we've all been unfortunately subjected to. So I want to give you an idea now scripturally. So if you will turn with me to Matthew 15 and Hear a little bit of what Jesus says. That's really going to be my concern here. Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? And I want you to really wrap your mind around this tradition of the elders, not tradition of God, tradition of the elders. For they wash not their hands when they, when they eat bread. He answered and said unto them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? Now, you notice the difference here. He says tradition of the elders. He says commandment of God by your tradition. These are, you know, you can read these things and read right by them and not really see the impact it should have on us. For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But ye say, whoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus ye have made the commandment of God of none effect by your traditions. So here we have very plainly this encounter with uh, scribes and Pharisees, and they basically put the word of God on an even plane with things that they have invented or they've grafted onto their faith. This is a problem, and I'm going to tell you why, because you read this in other places as well, but very subtly here, tradition of the elders, why are they not keeping those traditions? He asks, why are they not keeping the commandments of God? So, um, you know, every time in, in Jesus' day, every time the Pharisees brought up scriptures. If you find all of the references, and specifically there are several out of Matthew 15 and then Mark 7 are the bulk of these examples, you will find that the religious folk of Jesus' day basically did what the church did later, which is put 
basically elevate their customs and traditions to be on par with the Word of God. And Jesus always did one thing. He always brought them back to the Word of God. He always basically not buying into it. You know, if that's your deal, but I'm not Jesus. I'm not buying into this. So it is important as I do this message to explain, as I said, why I'm doing what I'm doing. We dealt with the traditions out of Catholicism last week, so here we go with our wonderful Protestant uh, heresies. You ready? Okay. The first one, and you've heard me talk about this a lot, but I've never told you the origins. The first one is the altar call. Almost never used in the 19th century. We start to see more and more of it in the early 20th century through the Holy, Holiness and Nazarene movement. It will appear in 1908 as a part of a commencement exercise from uh, Pacific Bible College. And by 1919, it is kind of accepted as an altar call. The term altar call is being accepted as very routine. Uh, the practice of the altar call, though, this is what is interesting. It comes to us through the British and American revivalist preachers. So you can, you can pinpoint the place where this starts to happen. Now, many of you are familiar with names like Charles Finney, who contributed to the Second Great Awakening. But most people, most honest people, considered his techniques or his tactics incredibly manipulative. And that would be that after he was done presenting the gospel, he had something right in front of the, what would be his altar, the altar called the anxious bench. And basically people could approach this bench um, to pray, to be prayed for, uh, sometimes agonizing to make a decision for Christ. Um, but here's the thing, an altar call, which for some of my listening audience, maybe not too familiar, happens, you'll see it if you watch TV, for sure, happens on a regular basis at the close of any service where the minister or pastor will basically make an invitation for those people who want to come down to the altar and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And here we go to, res to come down to the altar and respond. Now, listen, I'm not that old, uh, and I'm not that old in my faith, but I'm old enough to know and heard enough stories and watched enough programs to see most of these grand crusades always had people to prime the pump. There was never, and seldom if ever, if I ever was in a service where they had an altar call, there'd always be people who were plants who were predetermined to go up that would make the, the ignorant who didn't know that these were plants easier to go up and break the ice for them to respond to the call. The problem is that this, and I've never said this before, this contradicts the scripture. And you might ask how, and I'm going to tell you how. And maybe you'll see that things are not as simple you know, in the book of Acts, in Acts 2, we have the day of Pentecost and Peter is preaching the sermon. 3,000 people are birthed into the church. Here is my big question. Was there an altar call on the day of Pentecost? Or did was that a miraculous work that God basically did by making it the harvest of souls? He doing the harvesting. There was no altar call. There was no call. You heard and you were quickened at the hearing. No one had to manipulate you and ask you. So I ask you again, and it is a perhaps a rhetorical question, but the altar call basically, there are a lot of denominations that stop doing it. If you read in some of the major denominations, the reason why they stopped doing it's quite fascinating. It's one of, it may be one of the reasons that I wouldn't do one anyway. But some of the major denominations have stopped because they have realized that what this produces for the most part is false conversion. 
Someone can be very moved in the moment to come up and answer a call. But the emotive part of that, which is not bad, is not based on what needs to happen for that individual to be able to understand the condition they're in, which is more of an analysis of your condition as opposed to an analysis of your emotional state of being. Does that make sense? So, if Jesus meant what he said when he said, no man can come to me except by the Father which hath sent me, draw him. Literally, no one, no human can do it on their own. Means It doesn't mean that you can't have a stirring inside that says, I feel like I need to know more about God. It doesn't mean that, hear me out carefully, there may have been people to answer an altar call that were genuine and sincere in their desire, in their responding, which was not purely emotive. But the problem is, without solid Bible teaching, without understanding, first, who Christ is and then what he did, the, the magnanimous act that he has done for all of humanity, can barely understand someone who would act to make it more of an emotional decision versus more of beginning with an analytical, we'll call it critical analysis. You mean that this was done for me? Not emotionally at the first. It can be emotional. So what's important here is that altar calls are an invention. They are an invention of the 20th century. Um, and basically, as preachers started to simplify their message of salvation, and you had great gatherings, it becomes easy to see, and this dovetails into something else, which is another heresy. Oh, boy, some of you are just going to hate me, but that's okay. So you got the altar call that leads you into the sinner's prayer. I've never talked about this one either, so let me just kind of go down the pathway here. Um, C.S. Lewis called this the great cataract of nonsense, and I think that's probably the best way I could put it. Okay, so somebody responds to the preacher saying, if you died today, do you know where you're going? And if you want to go to heaven, you have to come down here now, every head bow. Oh. And here come the people. And then they're all standing down here waiting. Listen, I don't want to make a mockery of that. Most of those people do it in a very innocent. They don't know any better. So it can be very moving for that person. But then here comes the add-on, the sinner's prayer. Now that we got you down here and we we got your butt out of the seat. Repeat after me. Please don't. <laughs> I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I've sinned. God, if you'll forgive me, welcome me into the kingdom. If there, there's a, all these different, but they have the same, uh, more or less the same verbiage. What's the problem with this? Well, I guess there's a twofold problem. You see, while people gathered in great crusades, you had the altar call, and then you'd have the prayer, whether it be the prayer of salvation or the sinner's prayer, but with the advent of radio and television, people could no longer come forward if they were listening in their own homes. So the method of the sinner's prayer or the prayer of salvation began to be used as a way these two things, and you can do your own investigating on this. There's a lot of history and a lot of information out there, but these two things did something for the preachers, which I think is something that probably fed egos and did more damage than good. And anybody who thinks that they have the capacity, this is the thing, this, this is not a Protestant bent, this is a biblical bent. If you think you have the capacity 
that you really decide to come to Jesus, you really don't know theology. God works in every creature preveniently, which means before you ever know him, he knows you. Before you ever thought about church, God, salvation, eternity, death, dying, heaven and hell, he already had your number. So how can you be so glib and actually so dishonest, now I'm speaking about these folks who implemented this, to make it, put it back on the individual. They can decide. Now listen, I didn't, and I've said this for many weeks, I didn't answer a call. And I also shared with you many times that in the early days of my faith, I thought I should go somewhere to answer an altar call because everybody does that. That's how you're, isn't that how you're saved? Until I figured out that that wouldn't mean anything. It would only mean something to me and it would be part of a tradition for me, but it would not be something that I could say God did. So it, it actually, you've got to be really careful as you go down this pathway of what is of faith and what is of works. And here we begin to peel back. A lot of people think works, get out there and do good deeds. But what if works are also trying to do God's work for him instead of him letting, letting him do what only he can do? So we definitely have some uh, problems here. This sinner's prayer, by the way, uh, begins to be used, makes its mark, and becomes permanently engrafted in the 1940s. Most people attribute this to people like Billy Graham, who used it in almost all of his writings, tracks, every single crusade. I'm not sure. All I know is I believe that it did more damage. See, if God is God, I've said this before, if God is God, and I'm standing here telling you about the power of God and the possibilities that God can and will. And then I tell you, but you know what? Just to be on the safe side, just to make sure that God is really who God is, let's add in a little something that you do just to make sure that, that we're all doing this together. But then it's no longer God. And now you've just basically grafted in without even knowing it, a concept of works, not faith. Faith says, God, said he would, therefore he will, therefore I am saved. So there are these things we, we go through. Another one of these, and we'll just kind of, we'll just meander through all of these subjects. Another one of these is there is a whole denomination that believes that if you do not speak in tongues, you are not saved. See, we have our own heresies, okay? This particular, and it is a heresy, this particular heresy comes out of, oh, I'm making friends today, can you tell? This particular heresy comes out of the oneness movement. <clears throat> Holiness, oneness. And basically, this is another one of these things where you almost have to go, what? I don't, I'm not understanding this. Um, a whole group of people that basically says, if you do not speak in tongues, which is in their, in their denomination, that is the mark of salvation, then you are not saved. And they will either work at getting you to speak in tongues. You remember the famous Gene Scott story, you're kicking my shins, you're kicking my shins, right? They get somebody in a barn somewhere in a big meeting and you know, you gotta speak in tongues for, for people to know you're saved. So they start kicking you and pouncing on you and you know, you're screaming. So evidently that must've been the, the sign, that must've been the, but kind of nutty if you think about it. And the reason why it's nutty is because these people have taken Acts 2, 8, 10, 19, etc., where if you want to read those properly, it's very clear that tongues were given first. And this is the clarification that most people never look at. Tongues, glossolalia, are meant in two ways in the scriptures. One of them is a comprehensible language of a nation. Remember on the day of Pentecost, how be it that we hear and understand 15 or 17 languages and they understood in their own language. 
there's a concept of tongues right there that says we're dealing with real, understandable language. How be it that we all understand each in our own tongue, in our own nationality, in our own language. So there's one meaning there, and then there's tongues. The language, we'll call it of prayer, a prayer language, which oftentimes is and cannot be understood. And Paul says in writing to the Corinthians, he says, and you need an interpreter. And if there's no interpreter, shut up. Now, he didn't say that, but pretty much he says, if there's no interpreter, stay quiet. I find, you know, I've been to places where people are busy spouting off in tongues. No one is even trying to understand, probably because they can't, probably because of other reasons, which we won't go into right now. But there's no interpreter. See, people will do things. This particular thing is, look at how spiritual I am. I, I'm like a... I'm like a light switch. I can turn on and off and I can show you my spirituality. Because I'm so spiritual and I can just, it's like a light switch. But see, the people who do that are, again, doing what is indirect, where God's word says, that's not what I'm looking for and that's not it. See, it's up to us to recognize what is a sham, what is fake, and what is authentically from the Bible. It's up to us to study these things. So you have a whole movement that believes that if you do not speak in tongues, you are not saved. Now I have a question for you. Have you ever met a Christian who is mute, not able to speak? I have. I've met many. So you mean to tell me that those people who cannot speak, who will probably never utter a word, are not saved because they can't speak in tongues? Do you see how nutty that is? See, God does not do this type of stuff. It's, it is humankind's insanity to put some of these things forth. And what this produces is somebody thinks, well, I'm very spiritual because I speak in tongues. And somebody who does it says, well, I must not have what they have produces this inequality when very, very clearly there are several things we can know about tongues. Now, some people will have take issue with this, but Paul spells out that there are some people, for example, that speak in tongues. I have my Bible open to 1 Corinthians 12 where it says, these are the, these are the, the gifts, if you will, and the fruit. This is the fruit for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another of prophecy, another discerning of spirits, another diverse kinds of tongues, another the interpretation of tongues. Does it say all will receive? Thank you. So why should we be under the impression that all need to speak? I like my uh, exaggeration here that all need to speak. It drives me crazy that anybody would join a denomination. Yes, I know I'm going to get hate mail, but it's okay. I'm used to it. Why would you join a denomination that is basically telling you, you need something more than faith in Christ to be saved? You tell me. Because I think if my Lord and Savior could materialize right now, I don't just think he'd say heresy. I think he'd probably give a nice little zap and just wipe out a block of people who are, they have complete, blatant disregard for God's word. And you might say, well, what's wrong? But this is spiritual. What's wrong with that? Okay, here's what I'm going to tell you. Because I'm going to get to some other things that some of you are, again, I'm going to touch on some stuff that you haven't heard me talk about. And you might say, well, you know, you're just a killjoy or, you know, you're, a, you're, too, you're too hardcore. Well, if I'm hardcore, it's because I don't want you being misled. And if I'm too hardcore, it's because I see too many people being misled. And if that's too much for you, then maybe you need to go somewhere where you just get a little pat on the head and maybe you get like a little doggy treat or something and you're told you did a good job for doing nothing, not learning anything and not understanding that this is why Jesus said, 
you make void the word of God by your traditions. Think about that. You nullify this book by your continuing to do and add on to what's not there. And this is, this is the Lord speaking. This is not me in my desire to convey. Okay, well, I got more. Got a lot more. So let's start tackling some interesting stuff. How many in my audience here think that Lent is only for Catholics? Mm. Okie dokie. Might surprise you that Lutherans, Presbyterians, Methodists, Anglicans celebrate Lent. It's not just Catholics. And in fact, in the last, this is baffling to me, in the last 20 years, the adherence to Lent has gone up in the Protestant denomination by 30%. So let's ask the question, and now this will benefit both my Catholic and my Protestant listeners. You, we ought to be concerned when somebody writes down that these are traditions passed on by the apostles and the disciples when we can go back in history and find no evidence whatsoever on the part of the disciples or the apostles for Lent. And I will explain in a little bit here. But the practice actually begins to surface after Christianity is legalized, after the Edict of Tolerance or the edict that was given in 313, 313 AD. And it is after the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD that we begin to see a type, not standardized, but a type of celebration that looks like Lent. Now, if you go back, you'll find that before the year 300, we have people, we have good evidence in Arrhenius and Tertullian, these are historical names, where people fasted for one day before Easter, one day, a complete fast, but actually it, it morphed into 40 hours of fasting in preparation for Easter. But there was never a 40-day period. <clears throat> this, uh, if you want to understand this better, becomes a lot clearer. After the Council of Nicaea, we see a progression being added. It first starts with two days, and it goes to six days. And by about the fifth, sixth century, we have a full-blown 40 days of fasting. Now, you have to listen to what I'm going to say, because otherwise this is lost. Now, there's a lot of people that don't even know what Lent is. So the imaginary, fictitious Lent is 40 days, the 40-day period, uh, basically, that starts and will take you all the way to Easter. Those are the 40 days called Lent. Um, and there is no biblical representation. There is no biblical cause for this, but it is celebrated. Here's what modern day folks do. They say, what are you giving up for Lent? Do you, ever, do you know anybody here, anybody here that you know somebody who celebrates Lent? Oh boy, <laughs> it's a mixed congregation. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so you have some folks you know that, that celebrate. Did they, did they ask you, what, what are you giving up for Lent? Because I had somebody ask me, what am I giving up for Lent? They said they were giving up chocolate. And I, I said, if, if Lent was really that serious and we're looking at Jesus' sacrifice of laying down his life, your paltry sacrifice of chocolate is a mockery. If you're gonna, if you're gonna make this legitimate, friends, okay, what are you giving up? I mean, Again, these are traditions that have crept in. People celebrate them as if they are official, as if they are part of the faith. They are the traditions. Now, somebody may say, well, do you, do you think that this is a, you're going to go to hell for celebrating these things? As I said to you, I'm just the messenger, don't shoot me. I am trying to tell some of my audience that we've added on so much garbage 
that we're no longer fixated on, on the things we should be fixated on, the, the front, center, and core of everything in Christ, we have all these auxiliary things we've added on almost as a distraction to not have to deal with the real matter. Getting to know God through his word, through prayer, and not through all these, we'll call them add-ons. Now, I know there's people out there that will be really angry and say, well, but, but I celebrate this and, you know, it, it's a real holiday for me. Well, maybe it is for you. I'm not telling you to stop doing what you're doing. I'm trying to tell you, just inform yourself and know why, where, and how it came to be. And then you can say, hey, it's like Christmas. I'll keep celebrating Christmas as long as I know that everybody else around me knows and understands. I'm going to get there in a minute. I'm, I'm actually going there. <clears throat> so another question may be, well, why 40 days of Lent? Who, who, if they came up with this, why would they put 40? Well, we know 40 in, in the Bible is a number of complete testing. Moses, two times, we have the number 40 for him. We've got 40 for the number, the children of Israel wandering in the desert, Jesus, in the temptation, before the temptation, we've got 40 days. The Noah's Ark, 40 days and 40 nights. So 40 is a complete time of testing. So now I'm going to ask you this question. If the 40 in Lent is supposed to represent a complete time of testing for the believer, what are you being tested on? How much chocolate you won't eat or how much uh, you won't drink of something? You see... I don't know if you can see, but this teeter is right on the cusp of actually making a mockery of what Christ did. And you could say, well, how do you see that? Well, I'm just telling you. And it's that sensitive to me. It's that sensitive to the subject. We might as well move on because some of you are saying, well, okay, yeah, so, so what? Well, then let's go to the next part of this. Because you also, I saw the hands go up for um, Lent, then you should also know that Protestants also celebrate, as Catholics do, Ash Wednesday. We don't. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not that ashy of a person. But just so we can be clear about the ash part of this. Ash Wednesday was introduced into the church by Pope Gregory the Great in about the year 600 a church add-on. Now, if you know anybody who ever has ashes put on, usually it, it's a quote from Genesis 3.19 as they're putting the ash, from dust you came and from dust you'll return. I get it. Quoting a little bit of Bible, putting a cross on your forehead, and you might think, well, what's the harm in that? You walk around and some people see you and think that you didn't wash yourself pretty good. Other people think you're a freak and other people go, oh, they went to church. Except this year, you know, you can do your own ash. <laughs> now, let me rephrase that. <laughs> this year, you can do your own ash. All right. No, I didn't rephrase it. It just sounded better in that radio voice. Uh, United Methodist, Lutheran, etc. celebrate. Uh, Ash Wednesday. <clears throat> now, the reason why I bring this up is like anything else. If we understand something as a tradition or as a heresy, we can then kind of weigh out certain things and understand better that they're not part of our faith. They don't belong there. Let me ask you this next one. How many of you grew up and had to eat fish on Friday? Do you have any reason why? Because if you look it up, it's quite disturbing. Okay, now I'm going to open up a can of worms. All the other stuff, you can be a little mad at. This one will really tick you off. So the logic behind fish on Friday is supposedly, well, this is where it all falls apart. Supposedly because, supposedly, tradition says Jesus died on Friday. And therefore, we ought to not eat meat so we eat fish. 
There's only one problem with that. Jesus didn't die on Friday. That's not Melissa Scott's opinion. Uh, if we do the investigating, see, again, we go back to a lot of problems that people do not want to address. I've gotten more arguments over this with other pastors. In fact, God rest his soul, but one of the individuals I would go at, and we would go at it hardcore, uh, because they had an understanding about this three days and three nights that obviously was special to them uh, that no one else could have. But here's the thing, Jesus specifically, when he was asked, and he was asked directly, give us a sign proving who you are. And Jesus said, there'll be no sign except the sign of Jonah, typifying the three days and three nights in the great fish's belly. Now, there'll be people who will completely throw this out because there couldn't be, the story of Jonah couldn't be real. I, I, I realize that there are a lot of people who don't understand that God, who created everything, it's no big deal for him to make a giant fish that either talks, walks, or poops out people. It's not a big deal for him. It might be for you because you're not God, but he's God, he can do it. So they ask him and he very clearly says three days and three nights. So I have a question for you and we've done this many times, but if Jesus, and, and just, just going by the traditional reading of the Bible, if Jesus died on Friday, if he was crucified on Friday, and clearly, even the people who hold to this say that he, he had to have been in the grave before sundown, before the Sabbath, even those people that adhere to a Friday death. Here's the problem with that, though. If Jesus said three days and three nights, you can't get three days and three nights when you start on Friday the way the Jews measured time not like how we measure time in our current modern time. So you can't, get two, you can't get three days and three nights from Friday to Sunday. You could get three days and two nights, but you can't get three days and three nights. It doesn't compute. I don't care how you want to calculate or how you want to try and distort. You cannot get to it from this corner. And when Jesus said three days and three nights, he meant three days and three nights. How about that? But we have to try and, you know, booger things enough, which is what we do as humans. So here's the great problem. If you look at the Jewish calendar and you go through the feast days, you know that in the year that Jesus died, there were two, there were two Sabbaths, one high holy day in the middle of the week and the regular Sabbath. So when we're reading and understanding, we know a, a few things. We know he could not have been crucified on Friday. Ultimately, if you do the calculation, and if you actually are so bold as to try and locate a Jewish calendar, you begin to see the impossibility, and it is impossible, of a Friday death. Now, I'm not here. I probably will do it on Easter, which is coming up soon. I don't want to do it now. I don't want to take up any more time. But that's our justification for telling people to eat fish on Friday. By the way, there was such a great problem of how to get the masses to eat fish on Friday that a great invention came to us called filet of fish. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Mind boggling, right? Okay, let's, let's move on to the next one. There's so many that I can barely, I mean, I'm just touching on things because we, ha we have our own, you know, it's very easy to point fingers at somebody else, but see, this is the thing. I'll, I'm pointing the fingers right back at us. I'm not, not saying, and I don't want to be Pharisaical and saying, well, I'm not saying we do any of this. I'm sure we have our own uh, random things. And as I go, I, wanna, I will try to be cognizant because I want no part of anything that's grafted on. None. Okay, here is here is the, we'll call it the worst thing to happen to Christendom. A man by the name of Isaac William Kenyon 
He died in 1948. That gives you a little bit of the timeline. He is the father of the modern prosperity doctrine. Now, there's a guy that he may have preached and he may have been the pastor of a, of a big church and Bethel Bible College and all that other good stuff. But as far as I'm concerned, there's got to be a special corner for him somewhere on the other side. Um, I want to read you. His, his famous line is, what I confess, I possess. That was his famous line. And if you can't see how that fed into all the modern day charlat charlatanry, if that's even a word, the, the stuff that goes on all day long to tell people, I, I actually printed out uh, a whole bunch of comments, their quotes from um, some of the more known prosperity folks, but then I couldn't bring myself to read them to you in this building. It was almost like it would dirty the air with some of the things, but I'll just, just to kind of give you an idea without naming names or one of these that said, you know, you give a hundred dollars and you get a thousand back. That's not a bad deal. I'm sorry, what are, are we talking about Las Vegas or, or the church? Uh, you lost me there. So um, another one is the value of an investment is its dividends. The value of Christianity is you get a lot out of it. So this is the type of stuff that has turned a lot of people off. When you see what goes on today, and as I said, there are probably a half dozen real of the worst offenders of this type of thing, constantly telling you, God wants you to be rich. God wants to, God, 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 God. Okay, well, listen, this is what I do know. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says there are people that God does bless. Out of Deuteronomy, God speaking to his people, it is me that gives you the power to get wealth. Don't say you made it with your own hand. God says, I gave it to you. I gave you that power. Does God bless people? Absolutely. And don't think for a minute people have this all wrong. If God was so against possessions, tangibles, why on earth did he tell the children of Israel before they left Egypt to basically go and take all, everything that they could get their hands on, gold, silver, everything, if God was wanting his children to be impoverished? Why didn't he just send them out in their tattered clothes and schlep along with, you know, whatever they had? No, he said, you take it with you. And even told Abraham, before they went in, they'll come out with great riches when they come out in the fourth generation. So this is a case of somebody taking kernels of truth from the Bible, twisting them and adding just a little peppering of greed from the human nature. All of this can be yours. God will bless you with this. He's going to rain money out from, from I don't know where, and it'll fall into your pockets, and it'll hit your head, and I don't know what else it'll do to you. Um, you know, that's the tragedy. The tragedy is I have met people who have been blessed by God. In fact, there are several people here that I've known, either that they were, their businesses were blessed, uh, one individual here who seems to have the streak at winning the lottery. But that's not everybody. And in fact, I'd go so far to say that the lot of most people, you know where God keeps us? Most people, the ones that he's still trying to break you, he's still trying to make you, he keeps us just barely hanging on. For some of us, it's just barely enough to get by for the week. For some of us, it's just a health condition that just keeps us close enough to keep us on our knees talking to him because I really believe he knows our frame and knows if we had everything, we probably wouldn't be as needy towards him. If you think about it, it's a sad thing, but you know, when things are going really great, is the first thing on your mind to turn around and say, thank you, Lord, or is it saying that things are going great, right? That's our human nature. So when I, when I say, I believe God does and he can, but not everybody, and then please don't go using, because this is what they all do. All the prosperity folks will say, well, you got to look at Job. He had much. God was going to teach him a lesson, but in the end, he got it all back. And that's, their, and that's their story. That's their message. 
basically your life, well, they don't tell you this. They don't tell you your life's going to turn into basically hell on wheels and that it's probably going to suck for a real long time. And there'll be periodic bouts where you think the sucking is over, okay? <laughs> and you feel like, whoa, it's great. <laughs> You're like on a roller coaster, but no, we're going down again. Brace yourself, right? That's Christianity. It's not a steady state. We have times of blessings and times where it is, remember the message, God is a famineizer. Before he is a blesser and bestower, he will put you in the famine zone so you can remember in the famine zone, he's the one that has the capacity to both get you out of there and put you back on the track, even if the track isn't a great track of great blessings, the blessing just to be back in the place that was comfortable. So there is good reason to look at these and they are heresies, and really be angry that through the generations we've had people creep in, just what Paul has warned in d diverse places, Galatians and certainly in Colossians. I'll say a few more. One of those, um, I mean, I have so many different places to go. I'm looking at all my notes thinking, where am I going to, how am I going to get to where I need to go? But let me take this one because it did a lot of damage to Protestantism, and that is fundamentalism. See, we, we've got a long list of things that we can easily forget, but fundamentalism, this is, this is the tragedy. It's a movement that began in the late 19th century, and it was a reaction to modernism. The problem is it went so far, the pendulum swung so far the other way, so fundamentalism, I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't dance, I don't, there's, just don't. <laughs> don't. Don't add anything else, you just don't. Okay, that's fundamentalism, don't. What? No, okay, that's just, <laughs> so can settle it like that. Um, the problem, the problem is that, see, there's always some good in something. Fundamentalism when it started, was a direct response to our children being taught evolution. Most people don't know the genesis of fundamentalism in America. It was a direct reaction to modernist ideas, specifically science and evolution. And see how everything is flipped in this time where we'll just say the teaching on evolution was upheld from, I believe, in American institutions from 1925 to 1967. And when, they, when that stay was taken away, it was almost like we began to flip everything. And these people, the Christian fundamentalists, they were trying to get back, to bring the pendulum back, but instead they took it so far the other way. Now you've got groups of these, even today, they are the people who go out and uh, protest at soldiers', sol soldiers funerals when they're being laid to rest. Um, one of those particular ones is particularly egregious with doing all kinds of stupid things under the guise of wanting to get back to the center of where we should be. But the fact of the matter is that is kind of a train that's left out of control. So when people talk about fundamentalism, it's no longer a thing to bring us back to a right understanding. It's gone so far the other way that probably most of us, if we entered into a fundamentalist church, would not survive. We would not want to be there, not for five minutes. Fundamentalism drove more people away from the church. I mean, probably for a time when it was at its highest, it was doing great until people started to figure out that you basically are in an environment where you basically can't do anything. Anything you do is a sin and will be used against you. Just saying. So um, we kind of move from that, and I, I'm just throwing a whole bunch of stuff at you. We move from that. I could talk about, for example, the need for infant baptism which seems to be very, people are very confused about this. Now again, this happens both in Catholic and Protestant traditions, both. 
But let me ask you a question. And the question is this. When Jesus first came on the scene, what did he tell the people? He said, repent, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. Now, John the Baptist, the forerunner, said, repent and be baptized. And then later the message is, repent and be baptized. So I ask the question, how can an infant repent? Now, a lot of people are confused about this as well. Baptism in the church. Baptism is an expression. It is basically, you're, you are publicly expressing what is already a known fact to you, your pastor, and God. So it's basically just that. When we turn, I mentioned this last week, when we turn baptism into something else, again, you're now you're taking off on something that it was never intended to be that. It was not intended for anything else other than a marked statement to the world. This is my testimony. I have been washed and cleansed, and I come up from the water to walk in newness of life with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So we have enough of these. So let me move to the last one, because the last one is all, you save the best for last, right? Supposedly. So let's see what we can come up here for our last disaster of the Protestant church, which it's definitely not, but okay then. Let's talk about Christmas. So the Christmas tree decorating and there are references to for example in Jeremiah and I believe in Isaiah there are two references but as we know it the Christmas tree is a product of the German Reformation and actually we have probably Martin Luther to blame for the tree um, now again these are these crazy things I don't think by putting up a Christmas tree you're gonna go to hell okay I don't think if you celebrate Christmas I've said this before just know why, know the origins of things, know that maybe this is not a real holiday. Now, Christmas, people fight about this. In fact, I was, while I was doing research, I stumbled up, uh, on a blog site, and man, these are two Christians verbally duking it out. I mean, it was, actually, it was pretty cool. No, it wasn't. <laughs> because one person said, Christmas is the most important Season, it's the most important holiday for Christians. Can't you see it's got Christ in it? And the other person said, no, it's Easter, you fool. And they were going at it. <laughs> and they were just going at it. And I was saying, no, it's Easter, you fool. Right? That's what I was doing afterwards, too, because here's the thing, and I've said this before. Uh, a child could have been born, and unless that child was the Christ child, the birth of a child, although miraculous and beautiful, would not have meant too much for us in our faith. But when we talk about Christmas, there are some things, as I pointed out, the Christmas tree is, is one of them. Um, people make a very interesting point, and I've only had this happen so many times I can't count anymore when I say Jesus wasn't born on December 25th. <gasps> And it's like one of those, you know, if you ever do the, if you use your, your smartphone, they have a rebound, you know, keeps, keeps going. It looks like people are rebounding when you say that. Ha, 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 right? They can't, that's, I can't believe it. My head's going to blow up. But we know we can trace the date of the birth of John the Baptist pretty precisely. So we know that Jesus was born after, and we know by those calculations it was not December 25th. Now, I've said this before, celebrate Christmas, have fun, give gifts, join, get together, do whatever you want, for goodness sake, but just don't make this into something. You know, people, every single year, Jesus is the reason for the season. Put Christ back into Christmas. Well, just look at the word Christmas in its origin, Christ Mass, Christ Massa. Does not, you know, think about it, if it was, if it was the birth of Christ, you'd have to kind of find words that represent birth, like gen, Genesis, right? Gen, why didn't they call it Christ Gen or something? But Christ Mass? 
which again, if you trace the name, you find that its origins are not really rooted, although it has Christ in it, not really rooted in a celebration of the birth of the Christ child. And I would say to anybody who's listened to me today, you may have tons more questions of why I said this is not, and that doesn't belong, and that's wrong. But the thing is, if I get you to go and search for yourself, that's the beginning of understanding. That's the beginning of progress. That's the beginning of you saying, I'm not interested in the traditions. The traditions, once you know what they are, you can view them in a different way. You can view them as, I'm not telling you to stop doing things. I'm saying, understand where they come from. And then you can make a real decision. Do I want to just do this for the sake of doing something then that I know is not part of my faith and more of a cultural, traditional thing? versus I don't want to do this anymore because it's not part of my faith and I'm looking for the purest form to get me to the closest that I can get in a day and age where I have so many distractions. I don't need the add-ons as distractions. I just need to get into the Word and figure this out, that there are a lot of things we do that just don't belong here. And you know what the sad part is? The sad part is that if you look long enough, you find that a lot of these things we've grafted on, we've accepted. And I haven't even exhausted, for the Protestant church, I haven't even exhausted our heresies. We have a lot of them. So when I tell you, like what Paul is saying, his instructions to beware, lest any individual, man or woman, try to steer you, lure you, deceive you, persuade you with smooth words, with easy ideas, simple things that, oh, well, that makes sense, so I guess we go along with that. Instead of saying, maybe this is a little bit more challenging for me, that instead of all these other things, I really do have to make my way by faith. You know what the scariest part of faith is? The scariest part is taking the first step and not knowing that first step, the real step of faith, not knowing, will God actually be there? Will God actually come through? That's much harder than navigating a faith that has so many different handles for you to choose from instead of the one option that he definitely gave. That one is to be faithful, to listen to his word, and to be obedient to him and him alone. That's why Paul said, not the traditions of men. Don't be led that way. But now let me change Paul's words and say, press and follow after Christ. We are not imitators. I'm not asking the question that was asked in the 90s, what would Jesus do? I'm asking, what are you going to do with all the garbage that's piled up in your suitcase of faith? Is today the day that you say, I'm, I need to let go of some of these things and find the pure faith that is the faith that's able to save and not all these other things? Or will today be, you know, I heard that, Pastor Scott, she just so annoyed me. She just blew apart. She's no good because she says all these things are, are not part of my faith and doesn't belong. Well, the truth sometimes is uncomfortable. But if you're willing to look at the truth, the truth does indeed set you free. And I pray for some of you, you'll be set free in Jesus' name. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.